Welcome to What Your GP Doesn't Tell You, the podcast for both doctors and patients with me, Liz Tucker. This week, I'm talking to neuroscientist Dr. Sabina Brennan. She argues that while we may be increasingly aware of the importance of physical health, we neglect the value of brain health. By giving our brains the right input, she believes not only can we increase our odds of either avoiding or delaying serious illnesses such as Alzheimer's, we may actually be able to build in resilience and slow down the ageing of our brains. Sabina points to research that shows how essential it is that at every stage of our lives, our brains receive the right stimulation at the right time. And she argues we completely fail to understand the teenage brain. Our brains are not fully formed until we're around 24. And due to this, in our adolescence, we're more likely to indulge in risk-taking and addictive behaviour. Yet Sabina believes that neither society nor the way we treat our teenagers really takes this into account. But before we get to Sabina's interview, a brief request from me. If you enjoy this podcast and would like to leave a review on Spotify or Apple, that would be much appreciated. It really helps. You can also become a paid supporter of the podcast at patreon.com slash what your GP doesn't tell you or via PayPal on my website, what your GP doesn't tell you dot com. A huge amount of work goes into both the research and production of this podcast. So even a small amount of money makes a huge difference. And you can find out more information about the pod on my website. Follow me on Twitter at Liz C. Tucker and on my Substack account liz.tucker.substack.com. Many thanks. Now back to the interview with Sabina. Dr. Sabina Brennan is a neuroscientist based in Ireland. She was responsible for running Trinity College Dublin's BrainFit, a study of brain health, lifestyle, genetics and dementia, and has published a number of books about brain health, including 100 Days to a Younger Brain and Brain Fog. Sabina also has a website, Superbrain, with advice on how to enhance brain health. And she has a particular interest in increasing the public understanding of science. Here's Sabina's interview. So Sabina, thanks so much for joining the podcast today. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you for having me. I think, Sabina, we're aware of certain aspects of our health. We know that exercise and diet is important for cardiovascular and general health. But do you think we undervalue brain health? Oh, absolutely. I actually tend to start my talks by asking people, have they brushed their teeth this morning? And do you intend brushing them again this evening? And you pretty much have 100% hands up. And then I say, keep your hands up if you consciously did something for your brain health today. And pretty much all of the hands go down. My point is made, you know, your teeth are super important because you need them to speak, to eat and to smile. But you need your brain for absolutely everything. There isn't one thing that you can do without your brain. So brain health really matters. And following that sort of dental analogy, at a very young age, when we only have our milk teeth, we learn about the importance of investment. Time spent now engaging in a particular activity brings forth future rewards. And you learn that if you do something additional, you know, like flossing, you'll do even better. But you know, when you become an adult, you realize, well, it doesn't come with an absolute guarantee. You know, you'll need a filling here and there and you kind of get to my age and some teeth start to crumble. But you know for sure you're in a far better position than you would have been if you didn't engage in a daily dental health habit. And the exact same principles apply to brain health, because just like dental health, knowing things like avoiding sugary drinks and brushing your teeth, et cetera, are good for prolonging the life of your teeth. We know that there are daily lifestyle things that we can do that can promote and prolong the health of your brain. Because I think if I go and see my GP, I might say, you know, I'm concerned about the health of my heart. But I'm, I'm unlikely to go in and say I'm concerned about brain health unless I've got obvious symptoms of some neurological disease. Yeah. And I think that's a really critical. You kind of really got to the nub of the issue, in my opinion, and I could be wrong. But in my opinion, I don't see that GPs see that as part of their remit. They see, yes, you know, I need to make sure your kidneys are okay and your liver and your heart and even your skin. And, you know, but I don't think that they really see it as an organ that they should be concerned about. Of course, if you come in with headaches and if you come in with 
issues or you've been having seizures or, you know, any of those kind of things, they will, of course, you know, look into it. But I still don't think they're even really thinking about the brain as an organ that needs to be kept healthy in a preventative sense. And yet, because the brain has this tremendous placidity and ability to change, that means presumably it's at least, if not more susceptible to being affected by how we live our lives. Yeah, I think you're absolutely spot on there. I mean, it's relatively recently in terms of decades that we've realized that the brain is not fixed and set in concrete. You know, you're born with this brain and you're stuck with this brain that is constantly changing. And you think because of this, we should be promoting brain health as early as possible? Yeah, we should be promoting brain health from before conception, because right in the womb, the behavior and lifestyle choices of of the mother is going to influence the development of the brain. And then when that baby is born, our brains are sort of the least developed of all creatures at birth. You know, you only have to look at uh, little foals getting up to walk pretty soon after they're born. And it takes our babies up to a year or more in some cases to learn how to to walk. And that's because their brain is going through a really critical period of development, which is why it is incredibly important that parents understand that they must stimulate that baby. Really, one of my pet hates is to go to a restaurant and see a toddler in a high chair with you know, swiping a device and watching something because that child actually should be learning and looking at, literally looking at the other individual's faces because that's how they learn how to interact and what's going on in the world and how their brain develops. Then we have another very critical period that I'm very passionate about raising awareness of. And that is that period from puberty to up to about age 24, the brain goes through a really radical transformation. And things that happen in those teenage years can disproportionately affect the brain in either advantageous or negative ways. And I just don't think people even are aware of that because our society is structured in a way that does not take account of this developing brain, particularly in regard to the frontal lobes, uh, which really are the last part of the brain to develop. And they're that part of the brain that are involved in critical decision-making, risk assessment. We assume that children have become adults and actually their brain isn't equipped and hasn't developed to make some of those decisions. And also that brain is really, really vulnerable to addiction in those years. And and I just don't think society has kind of kept pace with science in that regard, in both educating the individuals themselves, the parents, but also wider society, including things like teachers and police, etc. So Sabina, while the teenage brain is still developing, as adults, we need to be far more aware of how this can impact on behaviour. Yeah, the brain is developing. So the frontal lobes really haven't kicked in you have this heightened neuroplasticity. So actually the teenage brain is primed for learning. It is a brilliant time for that sort of academic learning or any kind of learning, actually, you know, it doesn't have to be academic. So it's hungry for information. The teen brain is like a sensation seeking organ, but then you don't have a frontal lobe that has fully developed to actually assess whether that sensation seeking is going to be risky or not risky. On top of that, your emotional system, I mean, teens genuinely experience emotions at a much deeper level than we do. The system is just kind of calibrating, but also at huge risk for depression and suicidal tendencies. Things seem bigger than they are and more terrible than they are. The amygdala, their fear centers, is is almost overriding the the frontal lobes. They're really just much more likely to succumb to addiction, particularly with alcohol and other drugs. Also, their brain doesn't respond in the same way to alcohol that an adult brain does. So they consume enough, they can consume an awful lot more alcohol before they realize they've had too much. So you and I know you can, you know, maybe sitting down, chatting to people, have a great night, not being monitoring what you're drinking and you get up to go to the loo and you kind of go, oh, <laughs> I think I'll have water next. <laughs> I've had, you know, one glass too much. That doesn't really happen in a teenage brain because they don't have that frontal lobe to kind of, you know, kind of keep things in check. 
they haven't yet developed the ability to learn from mistakes. My argument is that parents or other adults have to be their frontal lobes. It's, you know, you really have to sort of step in there and go, okay. And I think it's easier if you explain to people, well, look, this is your brain. It's still undergoing development. So this is what's happening. Rather than me, a parent, trying to control you, I'm not. I mean, you don't send a toddler off out to walk until you've supported it through various stages. So you mentioned experience in the adolescent years can have a disproportionate impact on the brain. Yeah, almost what can happen is, you know, a maladaptive uh, stress response. So, you know, either then in later life, they don't have, I hate to use the word normal, but they don't have sort of an average stress response. They'll either hyper respond or actually the reverse can happen, you know, almost this closing down of, of, of a stress response. But it's a difficult balance, isn't it? Because for a healthy brain, we do need a certain level of stress. Stress is essential for the neuroplasticity that we want to harness for a healthy brain, because any learning, anything new that you engage in, any change that you encounter generally involves the stress response. That's kind of what gets you to achieve your goals, etc. The stress issue becomes problematic when it becomes chronic and the feedback loop doesn't work and you're in a heightened state of stress all the time. Or, and this is what doesn't get talked about enough, or if you have too little stress, because too little stress is not good for your brain either because it, it leads to boredom and depression and your brain is not going to waste energy on brain cells that aren't being used. So you will have atrophy of brain cells. But Sabina, discovering what your ideal stress level is sounds quite tricky. Yeah, I mean, I suppose it's it's trial and error. I think you can start small. So novelty is key for neuroplasticity. When you go to a restaurant next time, order something different. <laughs> you know, we tend to go to a restaurant and we go, oh, no, I know that's really nice. I'm going to have that. Or try a vegetable <laughs> you've never tried before. Or a very simple thing. Try listening to a genre of music you've never listened to before. I guess the point I'm making is if you want to harness neuroplasticity, that requires learning, change and novelty. So, um, of course, you can continue doing what you absolutely love doing. And people often say that to me about crossword puzzles. Oh, I do Sudoku or I do crosswords. That's absolutely brilliant if you enjoy doing them. However, if you want to harness neuroplasticity, you've got to make them a little bit harder for yourself each time. People often naturally do that. So if we want to grow long-term brain health, neuroplasticity is important. And that matters because it helps stimulate growth. And the greater the number of neuronal pathways, the better for our brain health. Yeah. So if we explain it in the context of dementia, well, I'll say Alzheimer's disease, because most of the research is done on Alzheimer's disease and dementia. It's both an umbrella term for multiple conditions that give rise to the symptoms that we also refer to as dementia. If you get the pathology of Alzheimer's in your brain, so the plaques and tangles that are the hallmarks of the disease, certainly in the early stages, it's not about how much disease you have in your brain. It's about how much healthy brain you have to cope with that disease. Brings us to another thing, which is a form of resilience called reserve. So 1986, there's a paper where the researchers are looking at the slices of the brain post-mortem, looking at the brains of people with a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, and then at controls also in nursing homes, match for age, et cetera, with no diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. The researcher was called Katzman, and he found 10 cases of cognitively normal individuals who had sufficient pathology in their brain for diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. So that then sparked a huge area of research and the research area that I did on my PhD and ran a dementia and brain health research program on in Trinity. And basically, those people were resilient in some way. They had the pathology, but they didn't have any perceptible symptoms. What has transpired over the years, and now it's moved on into other diseases, you know, things like multiple sclerosis that occur in early life that are also marked by cognitive impairment, but even looking at things like rheumatoid arthritis, etc. Basically, what they found is that resilience is directly linked to lifestyle factors. Can I just ask you about the stat on that? Because in your book, you said, I think it was 25% of people who have the clinical pathology of the most common form of Alzheimer's 
don't show symptoms of the disease. Yeah, it's kind of a challenging thing in terms of measuring these things. Because most of the time we won't be doing autopsies, so we wouldn't know. Yes, absolutely. And then also perceptible symptoms. Because most of these measures of brain function, we look at average. So if you're assessing someone using a measure of memory function, for example, or attention, you'll generally look at the person's age and gender and see where their score falls and does it fall within the average range. So that means then you have a bunch of people who should be performing possibly way above average. They'll come up as normal. So if somebody's way above the cognitive average, even if they lose some of that ability, they'll still be above the average when these memory tests are done. Yeah, they don't appear a vulnerable population because they say, oh, well, you're performing fine. But they're a vulnerable population because something is happening that's causing decline. We need to start taking some measures routinely so that we have a baseline. It is important to always assess these things based on how you normally function or how you usually function. And then if there is a change, there is very solid evidence that, you know, lifestyle factors do help to build brain resilience. We now have 12 risk factors that account for potentially 40% of all cases of Alzheimer's disease. They are very common health issues that a lot of people fall victim to that are really generally lifestyle induced. So you have things like type 2 diabetes, midlife obesity. It is about empowering people to understand that Your obesity may increase your risk of developing dementia, your type 2 diabetes, the fact that you smoke cigarettes, the fact that you drink alcohol, the fact that you don't take exercise, you know, these all increase your risk. It's funny, people go to a doctor, somehow they feel validated if they walk out with a prescription. And if they walk out with lifestyle advice, they don't feel validated. The fact of the matter is actually... So much of our lifestyle is the reason that we need prescriptions further down the line. And so the hope is if we have a healthy lifestyle, we can delay or prevent some of those prescriptions being needed. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And that's the thing with adopting a healthy lifestyle in terms of dementia. It does not prevent you from getting the disease, the pathology. That has to be made absolutely clear. What it can do, however, is change the entire trajectory of the disease. And that's what's important. And that's why now now we tend to draw a distinction between Alzheimer's disease and Alzheimer's dementia. So Alzheimer's disease being the pathology in your brain, Alzheimer's dementia being those symptoms that we've grown accustomed to, confusion, memory issues, etc. And so essentially by adopting a brain healthy lifestyle, You may still get the disease. However, you may be able to push out the time at which you would experience symptoms. And in fact, you may push it so far out that you die of something else before you experience those symptoms. And the point being, you get all those extra years in a position to live independently in your own home. The thing is, and it's only fair to say this, if two individuals say at the age of 65, start to get the pathology in their brain, one has high reserve due to their lifestyle and one has low reserve. The individual with low reserve will gradually start to show symptoms, mild ones at first, and it could be over a 20 year period. The person with high reserve will show no perceptible symptoms. And I do think the perceptible is important, but they will continue along sort of straight trajectory with no no known symptoms. However, what seems to happen is they reach a critical point. It's like a critical threshold where their healthy brain, you know, what's left of the reserve, it's just all being used up. And what happens generally is those individuals will have a precipitous drop and meet, if they're both still alive, sort of meet that other individual at that point. And another interesting part is that From about the age of 30, the brain starts to atrophy. The brain starts to shrink. It it was kind of thought there was nothing you could do about it. But the research now is showing that actually by adopting a brain healthy lifestyle, you can maintain that brain volume. So Sabina, what happens if someone already has damage to the brain? Is a brain healthy lifestyle still going to be useful for them? 
Absolutely. And there's one study, it's a, it's a study from quite a while back, the Bronx Healthy Aging Study. They were interested in the relationship between education and stimulating activities to see whether mentally stimulating activities could counteract for low levels of education. So basically, they recruited 488 healthy adults and they followed them over five years. During that period, 101 went on to develop dementia. Now, basically, they were looking at the impact of mentally stimulating activities that were really things that you and I would call hobbies. So reading, writing, crossword puzzles, games, discussions, music, etc. And what they found was that engaging in one activity for one day per week delayed the onset of rapid memory loss for two months in the individuals who had developed dementia. And the interesting thing was that positive effect was independent of education level. So really, that kind of is just a very simple study that illustrates that it is never too late to adopt those mentally stimulating activities. And that's interesting, isn't it? Because that was only one day a week. So it makes you wonder if there'd been more intensive activity over three, four days, if that would have had an even greater effect. And it's why I'm not a huge fan of sort of nursing homes. Too many things are done for the individual. And it comes from a place of caring. You know, we tend to think that if someone is ill or whatever, our natural instinct is to help and to do things for them. Uh, And if anyone is listening and, and caring for a loved one who has dementia, avoid doing for do with because by doing things for them you're actually in some way accelerating their decline because they're losing that capacity i would encourage uh, loved ones to dress themselves to wash themselves safely to prepare their meals you can support them through these things as their needs change but they should be engaging in stimulating activities and don't assume because someone is not vocal or looks distant or whatever that they still don't need the same things that we all need. They do. They need love. They need affection. And often we have to become detectives to figure out what they're trying to communicate. Instead of medicating, if people just kept a diary to see what's preceding those, because often they are a means of communication. And it can be something as simple as, I don't want to wear that cardigan. It's itchy. It makes me scratchy. Take it off, but has lost the capacity to explain that. And conversely, I advise people as well to look at the activities and note the activities that precede really pleasant moments and encourage more of those. I mean, there's still a fully fledged human being in there. If someone's your father, your mother, your wife, they remain that and don't infantilize them and talk to them as you would before. But don't focus on the disease, focus on the person. It really doesn't matter if they don't know your name or that they don't remember what you did yesterday focus on enjoyment and being kind, they will know their emotional memory will recognize that when you walk into the room, this is somebody that I have a good time with, as opposed to, oh no, this is somebody who's going to make me feel bad and ask me questions about what I remember or don't remember. And it can be hard to do that. My own mom had dementia and I can absolutely testify that 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 works so much better, focusing on the now and having fun in that moment. Now, you've suggested for all of us, building brain resilience to reduce our chances of developing various types of dementia. There are a number of steps that we can take. And I think it'd be useful for listeners just to talk through those sort of Mm -hmm. one by one. Now, the first that you mention is sleep. Sleep is absolutely critical for our general health, our mental health, and specifically for our brain health. There's two kind of key reasons that are relevant in this context. We're still only learning a lot of these things. We need sleep. Basically, when you take in information during the day, there's a small structure in your brain called the hippocampus. You'd have to turn the brain upside down to see it. And it sort of acts like a temporary repository for information coming in during the day. It has limited capacity and it can only take so much information in. That's often why by the end of the day, you kind of go, oh, my God, stop. I just can't take any more in. I need to sleep. And so when you sleep, we see electrical activity between that part of the brain and your frontal lobes. 
what scientists believe is happening there is a sort of a filtering process. Your your frontal lobes are making executive decisions about what information can be discarded and what needs to be kept. And a little bit later in the sleep process, we see a change in electrical activity. We see more diffuse electrical activity across various areas of the brain. And then in the earlier hours of the morning, when you go through sort of your last cycle of sleep, when uh, you are having more REM sleep than non-REM sleep, so that's more dream sleep, it appears that the new information is starts to be integrated with and linked to existing knowledge, experience, memories, etc. There's another thing that happens that's very kind of critical in terms of Alzheimer's disease, and that is your brain is a high energy organ and it produces a lot of metabolic waste. So when you sleep, it's a bit like the bin lorries come around at nighttime to clean the empty streets. <laughs> So basically, the deep cleaning of metabolic waste and other toxins, including beta amyloid, which is one of those hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease, they are cleared while you sleep at night. Whilst we don't know which direction the relationship happens with, but there is a relationship between poor sleep and Alzheimer's risk, we've got to prioritize sleep. And I think that has to be prioritized across our lifespan. And another point, which actually we discussed earlier in the interview, is stress. We all need stress in our lives, but the danger is chronic stress. Yeah, yeah. Poorly managed chronic stress is where the problem comes in. To cut a long story short, essentially what happens is the stress response becomes defective. Fight, flight and freeze are the three stress responses. And so basically what seems to happen with chronic stress is that feedback loop gets broken and, and it doesn't get switched off. On top of that, what appears to happen is neuroplasticity is switched off in your frontal lobes and enhanced in your amygdala. So to put it crudely, essentially, your amygdala gets bigger and stronger and your frontal lobes get weaker and smaller to the point where instead of your frontal lobes, your rational brain overriding your reflexive brain, your reflexive brain starts to override your rational brain. And so you end up living in this state of constant threat and fear and heightened stress levels. And you start to see threat where there is none. I mean, the problem with poorly managed chronic stress is that it can then be a big precursor to full blown anxiety. Sleep and stress are inextricably linked. Well, isn't that part of the problem? Because actually, if I think, gosh, it's really important that I sleep for my brain health and then I can't sleep. And I think, gosh, it's really important that I sleep. That's going to generate greater anxiety and stress. Absolutely. Do not do that, okay? Do not. We barely pause to draw breath during the day. And so when we get into the bed, it's the first time when we're still. And that's the moment where all the stress, all the stuff that you haven't processed comes in. I think people rarely think about giving their brain a break. I think people should be factoring in even five minute breaks every 60 minutes or every 90 minutes. Daydream. Daydreaming is fab for your brain in the sense, fab for you in that if you just let it idle, the brain activity changes and you might find even, even solutions. But taking breaks during the day, I think also scheduling some time into your day or into your week where you actually deal with specific problems whatever pops up before you go to sleep. I spoke at a conference about multiple sclerosis because brain health is particularly important for people with multiple sclerosis. My suggestion was to actually say, right, Tuesdays at 3 p.m. is when I mark out an hour and that's where I deal with, can I do something about this? If I can't, well, then there's no point in worrying about it. What will I do to deal with this stressor? And she had said to me, this girl, Gosh, only like 24 years of age. But she said for the years since her diagnosis, all she could think about was multiple sclerosis. She could get nothing done. I have multiple sclerosis. What's it going to mean? She said just doing that made a huge difference to say, right, well, I think about multiple sclerosis at this time. And then when it would pop into her head and say, no, I actually have an hour scheduled for that. At the moment now, what I'm doing is this. Your brain knows that something is important and it'll keep reminding you that it's important until you do something about it. And the doing something about it can be even as simple as putting it on a list, like writing it down, that it needs to be done. And there's a sense that, OK, well, that's in the system now <laughs> and the brain can stop reminding you about it. 
But absolutely, don't stress about not sleeping. That will only make matters worse. But things like managing your exposure to light, taking physical exercise, but not late at night. Simple things like that will actually help you sleep better without feeling you have to try to sleep better. Another thing that you talk about the importance of is social interaction. Yeah. Staying socially and mentally active. What is it about that that is good for our brain? It's a really challenging brain activity. When you think about it, when you're having a conversation with somebody, you're listening to what they say. You're also having to focus your attention. You're excluding other things that are going on around you. You're trying to make sense of what that person is saying. You're reading their body language. You're trying to figure out, are they telling the truth? Is that relevant? What does that mean for me? Are they lying? How should I respond to this? There's a huge amount going on in any social interaction. It seems to be an extremely stimulating mental activity. And from that comes this neuroplasticity. But also, they're sort of knock-on effects. They're interconnected. There was a large meta-analysis done. The researchers were looking at people who were lonely, socially isolated, or living alone. And what they found was people who were uh, lonely, living alone or socially isolated were between 28 percent and 32 percent more likely to be dead at follow up. It has been suggested that social isolation, et cetera, are as detrimental to your health as smoking and obesity. Now, as to why that is, there's probably a number of factors Being alone is not the same as loneliness. It's, I mean, I like being alone quite a lot. That's absolutely fine. And that's not detrimental to your, your health. Loneliness is something that occurs when your social needs are less than the social interaction you're having. Loneliness is an aversive signal, just like hunger or thirst. The purpose of it is to motivate you to engage in activity that gets rid of that feeling. So if we feel hungry, it overwhelms us, it motivates us to eat. Now, loneliness, for some reason, we don't respond to that in the same way as we do hunger and thirst. Feelings of loneliness means you've got to get out there, get connected. We don't. That's not an easy solution, because if I feel hungry, I can eat food. If I feel lonely, and obviously the answer to that is to go out and meet people, I can't just walk out my front door and do that. No, you can't. People with poor social skills aren't more likely to become socially isolated. It's the reverse. You become socially isolated and your social skills decline or appear to decline because your brain is on high alert. And you and I talking the whole time, I know this is a podcast, people can't see it, but we're nodding and smiling and socially interacting. So we're trying to find solutions for a problem we've created in how we set up society. Simple things like having a dog is, is hugely beneficial. Having a dog and going for a walk begets social interaction because people say hello. There's something more approachable about people who have a dog and people will talk to you. Volunteering is a great way because, you know, you're taking control and you're going volunteering and, and you can kind of meet other people. I do think that our GPs could help immensely. A lot of people, older people go to their GP because they're feeling lonely as opposed to anything else. I did some wonderful work uh, in Scotland. They had a team at the GP practice who would actually bring someone to the local men's shed club or get them set up in those kind of places. And they were part of their prescription. That kind of thing would be incredibly helpful and and life-changing. But I also think that the people who aren't lonely can help play a role by being more inclusive to people. If you're at an event and you see someone standing alone, chat to them. If they don't want to talk to you, fine. But bear in mind that it might be challenging. But I think we can all help that be more inclusive. But it is a challenge. I agree. Now, another thing you talk about, aside from social activities, mental activities, are the particular mental activities which are better for our brain? I think activities that you find enjoyable. But I mean, people often say, for example, that learning a musical instrument or learning a language is good because it challenges your brain in a number of different ways, as opposed to me just reading a book, for example. Telling someone to learn a language who has absolutely no affinity or no reason to learn a language is of no benefit and could actually add to stress. And and maybe they're never going to be able to use that language if they learn it. 
So I think, yes, if somebody already speaks some languages, try learning a new one. Or if somebody plays a musical instrument, up the game. Try a piece that's harder. Pick a new technique. And I'm not a huge fan of retirement. Obviously, I don't mean for people to be working in jobs they hate going forward. But if you love your job, reducing days rather than cutting things completely. Better for your brain to reduce work rather than stop. Yes, rather than just stop. Don't retire to do nothing. If you do retire, have another project plan in place that you absolutely love to do because sitting around doing nothing is a recipe for disaster and decline in your brain function. Another issue that you highlight is heart health yes. and diet. And I think people think about diet as being important for physical health, but of course, important for brain health too. Yeah, it's really important for brain health. I mean, your brain only weighs 2% of your body, but it actually consumes something between 20 and 25% of the nutrients circulating in your body. So basically, your your brain is very vulnerable and dependent on you to, to give it the nutrients that it needs to function well. And I would say rubbish in, rubbish out. And I totally understand that socioeconomic status plays an absolutely huge role, but To me, it seems paternalistic and unfair not to let those people know that actually that's rubbish. And if you eat that rubbish, it's going to affect how your brain works. What you eat absolutely matters in terms of brain function. And the best evidence we have is that a Mediterranean diet is important. And I think we need to educate people about what a Mediterranean diet is. It's not pasta. It's not pizza. It is fresh, colorful fruit and vegetables, lots of nuts and seeds. And that's how you can get your whatever they say, 30 a week or something like that now instead of five a day. It keeps going up. It keeps going up. I mean, this is me on one of my bandwagons again. But, you know, yes, I think it's important to learn wonderful things about literature in school. But I think it's more important to learn what a healthy diet is and how to cook for yourself and how to manage money and (laughs) all those kind of things. And I remember saying this years ago to someone and they said, oh, that's down to your family and your parents. That doesn't belong in the academic system. And I disagree, because if you do that, that's the surest way to keep people locked into poverty, because if the parents don't have those skills, they don't get passed on. And and I think it's an obligation we have. I contributed just before lockdown to an all party parliamentary group in the United Kingdom on ageing. Somewhere along the way, people abdicated responsibility for their health to the NHS. Actually, we need to retrain people and from children. The primary person responsible for your health is you. Nobody benefits more or suffers more by not looking after your health. If we supported people, you know, in those ways from very early on, showing them how to look after themselves and ingraining those habits from childhood, we would have. I believe, healthcare systems that could then focus on congenital diseases and those things that aren't primarily caused by lifestyle factors. That's a very long-term thing, but I think it's a long-term investment that could have huge payoff. But I do think we need somehow to get people back to valuing themselves and making decisions based on their own health and connecting the various ailments that they have to their lifestyle choices, as opposed to, doctor, tell me why I have X, Y, Z. There does seem to be increasing evidence that whatever diet you follow, processed carbs and sugar is not Mm. a brilliant thing. And if you can basically cook from scratch. Yeah. And I think that's one of the fundamental issues is a lot of people have never, have not grown up in homes where people cook from scratch. We treat food as a reward rather than an energy source. I mean, our brains are set up to make eating rewarding for a survival purpose. But usually that was counteracted by physical activity to go out and get that food. Outside of issues such as dementia, something that people complain of, and it can be due to the side effects of drug, possibly chemotherapy, and indeed many women complain of it when they hit the menopause, is something called brain fog. So brain fog really is an umbrella term that describes a collection of symptoms. It's not a disease. It's not a disorder. It's not a diagnosis in and of itself. But it is very real and it has been measured. And if there's anything positive coming out of COVID is actually being given 
the attention it's been screaming for for way longer than COVID has been around because people have come to realize how debilitating it can be. I tend to describe it as a warning sign or a signal that something is amiss and that you need to take action to identify what is the cause. It can be caused by an underlying health condition. Many of those disproportionately affect women. Autoimmune conditions, chronic pain conditions, you know, fibromyalgia, depression, migraine, multiple sclerosis, both disproportionately affect women also, neurological conditions. Also, it can be a consequence of a side effect of medications, unfortunately, used to treat those conditions, but also medications that are available over the counter, like painkillers, uh, antihistamines, anti-nausea tablets. Then, as you mentioned, it can be a consequence of hormonal fluctuations. And yes, it's a biggie for perimenopausal and menopausal women. I was concerned about women in menopause catastrophizing that their brain fog was dementia. So yeah, I mean, it really can be very, very debilitating problems, you know, sustaining attention, being forgetful, struggling to make decisions, loss of mental clarity. We've all sort of experienced those, but generally speaking, it's very short term and it might be after a few nights disrupted sleep. But the difference with brain fog is that the symptoms are persistent. And some of the earlier strategies we talked about in terms of helping maintain brain health presumably would also be useful to people with brain fog. Yeah, absolutely. It is prioritizing sleep, managing stress exercising. But again, if you've had something like long COVID or if you have a chronic health condition, exercise can be challenging. I've lived through that. I mean, I've had brain fog myself. I have migraine. I have an autoimmune disease, you know, and I'm going through the menopause. I was writing in the January of last year and I had got COVID in October and headache was one of my worst symptoms and it accelerated my migraine and put my whole migraine into a whole new stratosphere. So by January, I I mean, I was barely getting a clear day. And on top of headaches, I had other symptoms like vertigo and nausea and noise in my head. And I really wasn't able to function, just nothing in my brain. That went on for about three months. And I was really very scared that it wouldn't come back. Now, it did, came back absolutely fine. And I knew I had to follow my own advice, take things very gradually and gradually build up to doing those things. I hate not being productive. So one little trick that I have is I kind of keep a stash of easy, no brain stuff that I have to do. And if I'm having a bad day where my brain won't work, instead of frustrating myself, I do this easy stash of work. The data shows that brain actually evolved to monotask, not to multitask. And what we're doing when we think we're multitasking is actually task switching. And that comes at a price in terms of we make more errors and it actually takes longer than if you were to just do tasks sequentially. So I would say avoiding trying to multitask. Don't be afraid to ask for help, particularly if it's around work. If you had a broken ankle or you damaged your back, you know, your colleagues around you will accommodate for that. And we should be able to get to a point where say, look, I have a temporary issue here. Could I switch and work on this for a little while? Or could I get a bit of additional support? But I think there's tremendous nervousness about saying that to an employer, because effectively you're saying, I can't do my job in the way that I used to do it. And whereas it's a broken arm, they can see it's probably not going to affect your job if you've got a desk job. And they'll see that there's a clear end point. Me going in and saying, oh, I don't know how long this will last for. I know. I can't see a lot of employers necessarily responding terribly well to that. Oh, I agree with you. I agree with you. I think we're a long way off from it. I think part of it is educating everybody about how the brain works and how if it does malfunction, it impacts on things. But there are things that we can do. And for the most part, something like brain fog, it is temporary. And of course, you should ensure that you don't have any underlying neurological condition. Absolutely. Or autoimmune condition. The very first thing you you need to rule out is that there isn't something else going on. And again, GPs listening. And it has changed since COVID. A lot of women felt that they were being gaslit by their doctors when they would go with symptoms of brain fog. And Sabina, you were really concerned that early in the COVID pandemic, 
that attention wasn't being given to the long-term potential consequences of long COVID and brain fog. Yeah, the summer of 2020, and I wrote a piece in the Irish Times about it, about how there was so much focus on the number of deaths that we were missing out on a huge long-term impact, which would be long COVID and the brain fog issue. I mean, for me, that's the only positive I can take from the pandemic is that it's shone a spotlight on brain fog in a way that people are taking it seriously and recognizing how debilitating it is. And also that there are some things that we can do about it. So finally, Sabina, is that really how you'd like to see attitudes to brain health change in the future, particularly looking at things like brain fog and putting brain health really at the forefront of healthcare rather than a sort of afterthought? Yeah, I mean, I firmly and I genuinely believe this. If you look after your brain health, your mental health and your physical health follow. Your brain is your master controller. It is responsible for all of those things. But together with brain health, I would put brain awareness, understanding how your brain works. That, I think, is the most empowering bit, because then people can understand why they might be feeling anxious or fearful. And that therein, again, puts the control back in the hands of the individual owner of the brain. Well, Sabina, thank you so much for talking today. Thank you so much for having me. Bye. Bye Bye-bye. Hope you enjoyed the latest podcast. And a reminder, you can follow me on Twitter at Liz C. Tucker and sign up to the podcast mailing list at whatyourgpdoesnttellyou.com. Many thanks for listening. Bye for now.